afternoon everyone and welcome uh, to the 2017 History Research Seminar at the Library. My name is Sue Owen, I'm the Director, Excellence and Engagement here at Monash University Library. I wish to acknowledge the people um, of the Kulin Nations on whose land we're gathered today. I pay my respects uh, to their elders, past and present, and acknowledge the values we all, all hold dear in knowledge sharing and making meaning. We're delighted to be partnering with the Centre for Medieval and Renaissance Studies in hosting today's special research seminar here in the gallery of the Sir Lewis Matheson Library. We can't help but see, and sometimes hear, uh, the Transformative Works program going on around us. And later this month, we look forward to opening the library's new front door and celebrating the tremendous results of this groundbreaking project. A key goal in transforming library spaces has been to augment our contribution to the university's ambitious education and research agenda. To add value to the works of academics, researchers and students as they set about achieving their, their challenging and rewarding education and research goals. The library's new uh, range of student learning sp uh, spaces are flexible and technology rich inspiring students to collaborate and create, as we can already see. Our new Special Collections Reading Room provides white glove access to our wealth of rare and valuable items, some of which are here on display for you to see later. Our partnership with Monash University Museum of Art brings an enlivening wealth of art and culture to our spaces. And here in our gallery, we've introduced a gathering space a venue for library public programs and outreach with events such as today and soon an exhibition of literary treasures from our rare books collection. It's a very exciting time for us all and we hope that everyone particip participating today will return again many times to enjoy all the library has to offer. It's now my pleasure to welcome Associate Professor Peter Howard, Acting Dean of Arts, Director of the Centre for Medieval and Renaissance Studies and Convener of the Prato Consortium for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. As Program Leader of the Arts Focus Body in the City research program, he has worked closely with key Monash and international scholars, including our special guest today, Dr Jonathan Davies, investigating the multi-layered realities and understandings of the body in medieval and early modern societies. He has published widely in the areas of Italian Renaissance history and medieval sermon studies and is the general editor of the Europa Sacra, Sacra monograph series for Brepols. He has, has held fellowships at the European uh, University Institute Florence and at, and at Villa Itati, the Harvard uh, University Centre for Italian Renaissance Studies, where he has also been a visiting professor. Associate Professor Howard has won awards for his undergraduate and graduate teaching, for programs taught locally and abroad, and for excellence in higher degree by research supervision. Would everyone please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Peter Howard. Thank you so much for that rather fulsome introduction <laughs> to the introducer. I'm about to extend my remarks on Jonathan. Um, well, I think I'll begin by saying that I've known Jonathan really before the Alliance began. We had a fateful meeting in Florence trying to decide how we could bring together Warwick and Monash by way of Venice and Prato. And um, I need to say at the very start of his um, presentation today that I've accrued a large number of insults from Jonathan along the way. <laughs> now, we did have a discussion in the club the other evening as to whether I should actually introduce him by way of those insults. <laughs> and I have it here, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but anyone who wants to wait for drinks or lunch afterwards, I will be only too glad to supply them. <laughs> so it is indeed my pleasure to introduce Jonathan today. He is a visiting scholar in one of the arts faculty's focused research programs, The Body in the City. And in particular, he is collaborating with Megan Cassidy Welsh in the violence, appropriately, aspect of that. And I have news this morning from Routledge that we're well on the way to having a special series on body in the city, and um, they're very interested in the violence aspect. So um, that's, that's interesting and, and, and timely for today. Jonathan is Associate Professor in History at the University of Warwick, 
and co-coordinator of Warwick's program in Venice, which celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. He's also author of Florence and its University during uh, the early Renaissance, uh, Brill 1998, and Culture and Power, Tuscany and its Universities, um, Brill again in 2009. He's also editor of Aspects of Violence in Early Modern Europe, Ashgate 2013. He is a joint coordinator of the Warwick History of Violence Network, which is a focus for all areas of research into personal, social, political, and cultural violence and warfare. The network is strongly interdisciplinary, drawing on anthropological, economic, emotional, environmental, gender, geographical, historical, legal, medical, philosophical, political, psychological, rhetorical, sociological, spatial, and visual approaches. The network ranges from the late Middle Ages to the present and reaches across the globe with members working on Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe and the Middle East. And in addition to that network, I need to say that uh, Jonathan is a vital member of the Prato Consortium for Medieval and Renaissance Studies and is always present at our annual meeting in Prato each December for MedREN month and has been part of a, one of the driving forces behind the development of the Body and the City project. So, it's my pleasure and delight to welcome Jonathan to speak with us today. Uh, well, thank you, Peter, for your uh, very generous introduction. I look forward to being insulted later, <laughs> hopefully. And thank you all for coming and for giving me such a warm welcome. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about um, insults in early modern Italy. And I'll begin by saying that research on insults in the early modern period has been based largely, so far, on judicial records. And these records are extremely valuable, offering us access to the voices of social groups which are hard to hear otherwise. But, as David Garriott pointed out in his pioneering study of insults in 18th century Paris, such sources have their limitations. They only record those cases which came to the attention of the authorities, and other information regarding context and the relationships between those involved is often missing. I hope to highlight in this paper that other sources for the history of insults are available and useful. And in this paper, I'm going to be focusing on one of the longest and most detailed discussions of insults written during the early modern period. And this is a book written by the Bolognese professor Camillo Baldi, entitled Delle considerazioni e dubitazioni sopra la materia delle mentite e offese di parole, libre due. Reflections and doubts on the subject of falsehoods and verbal insults in two volumes. And it's published in Venice in 1634. For reasons which I'll explain later, this book has been neglected almost entirely by scholars, despite its richness as a source. But before looking at the book, I want to set it in the context of recent research on the nature of insults, on the high levels of violence in early modern Italy, and on the laws of honour which responded to and perhaps encouraged this violence. During the last 30 years, there has been growing research on insults, and this research has involved scholars from a range of disciplines. And to give you some examples, uh, the work here, we have economists, Douglas Allen and Clyde Reed, they're economists working on insults. We also have communication scholars, so Beattie and Pants, taking a sort of biological approach to insults. And we have experts in linguistics, Bax, Kadar, and Sorley. And this is just a very small sample to give some um, examples, some indication of the variety of approaches. Insults have also been of interest to historians working on Europe and the rest of the world. Traditionally, it was argued that forms of insult in Europe are essentially static or change very slowly, that they were based on taboos which were shared by different societies at different times, namely bodily excretion 
and sexual activity. However, in his study of insults in 15th century Bologna, Trevor Dean suggests that the most powerful of insults can in fact be culturally specific. Dean accepts that the general pattern of insult in Bologna conforms to that already established by research on 13th century Todi, 16th century York, or 18th century Paris. In these places, as in Bologna, there was a basic division between insults directed at women and those directed at men. Women were insulted through their sexuality or sexual decency. Men through their roles as carriers of public trust, or through their honesty, courage, and worth. According to Dean, however, the majority of insults were more complex than this. They were more varied in structure than a simple exchange of abuse. In his study of Roman insults of the 16th and 17th century, Peter Burke has shown how the sequence of elements of insults often started with a challenge, progressed through a statement of triumph, and ended in a threat. In another study of Roman insults in the 16th century, Thomas Cohen argues that so pervasive, so persuasive, so consistent with the language and gestures of Italian honor culture that one can, for the sake of argument, venture the risky proposition that acts of outrage exemplify a lay liturgy front. Dean emphasizes that men and women in uttering insults adopt different modes of defamation. Men take the active part. They claim sexual knowledge of their victims or directly threaten them with physical expulsion. According to Dean, women make only indirect threats and they had only a partial, incomplete control of the lexicon of abuse. Dean also found evidence which shares characteristics with forms of mock impoliteness, such as the modern game of ritual insult practiced by black youth gangs in the United States and studied by William Labov in a famous essay of linguistic analysis. The game is that of exchanging insults without actually damaging the honor or reputation of the victim. This is a ritual insult not a real insult. In Labov's interpretation, rituality is preserved by directing the insult against the victim's mother or other close relative. For example, your mother so black, she swept chocolate, which is clearly impossible, but that's understood. Labov posits the existence of shared knowledge between the speaker and the addressee, a shared knowledge that these far-fetched insults are impossible or untrue, and this prevents them from being construct, construed as actual insults. This theory of shared knowledge rests on the basic distinction of discourse analysis between what is said and the actions being performed with words. Apart from gender, Dean also notes the role of class in insults. He argues that men's insults cross hierarchical lines in two ways. First, because they make insults against men in positions of authority or in government office. Secondly, men's insults cross status lines more clearly than women's and they, become, they became more complex and multi-layered. Dean's evidence suggests that insults in which speaker and victim were of similar status tended to be simpler, and insults in which the victim was of higher status tended to be more complex. In order to damage the face and reputation of higher status victims, lower class speakers had both to multiply their lines of attack and to repeat the elements of defilement. And Dean suggests that Irving Goffsman's comments on aggressive, face-damaging encounters would seem to apply here. He likens them to contests in an arena in which the aim is to score as many points against the adversary as possible. The issue of insults is particularly important for the history of early modern Italy. 
as levels of violence were significantly higher in the Italian states than in the rest of Europe during this period. In his in his study of long-term trends in violent crime, Manuel Eisner has calculated that the homicide rate in England dropped from 7 to 6 per 100,000 of the population in the first half of the 17th century. That of Germany and Switzerland was stable at 11, while the Italian rate fell from 47 to 32. So it did decline, but it's still very high. As Stuart Carroll notes, Italian homicide rates did not fall nearly as quickly as they did in the north of Europe. In many regions of Italy, notably in the south and in the islands, the rates remained stable until the unification of Italy in the 19th century. However, Gerd Schwerhoff has questioned whether the long-time decline of violence from the 14th to the middle of the 20th century was real. He notes that the, the highly heterogeneous nature of Iceland's sources, and he points out that the, the judicial normative base in space and time is extremely variable. Schwerhoff also argues that the statistical data is undermined by the many problems with measuring the basic total figure for the local population. Moreover, the number of relevant analyses for the early modern period is still limited. There is no comparable data for France, and no accountable analyses of serial sources covering a long period for the German-speaking territories. However, Schwerhoff accepts that the level of violence did decrease from the 16th to the 18th century, though he rejects the idea of a long-term process. All that can be proven, somewhat empirically, is merely the fact that there has been a change in the levels of violence within a period of time that can be limited to 200 or 300 years. This does not apply to all parts of Europe, not, for example, to the Mediterranean area, where a distinct culture of violence prevailed for a long period of time. Recent research has moved away from the traditional emphasis on homicide rates. Instead, it focuses on the widespread prevalence of faction and feuding in the towns and cities of Italy in the early modern period. There are numerous sources which suggest that these forms of violence in the Italian states were frequent, and these levels were shocking to contemporaries. For example, whilst travelling in Italy in 1596 and 1597, the English courtier Sir Robert Darlington observed two ways in which quarrels were settled. For minor offences, got this quote for you, the party wronged, if not in some high degree, will challenge the other to fight. If they be both provided, it is presently undertaken. Otherwise, it is deferred till the next day, or some such short date. The place appointed is commonly in the city and in the chiefest street. Here they encounter with a good skull under their hats, a large male to their knee under their apparel, besides their gauntlet. So that if they had a supercilious for their face and would do as the boys do in England, bar striking at shins, or as the scholars of Padua who have plates for this purpose, no doubt, but Damitas and Clinias might thus make a tall fray. I saw two gallants in Pisa, five thus commonly provided, were after a very furious encounter and a most merciless shredding and slashing of the apparel, with a most desperate resolution to cut one another out of his clothes. They were, to the saving of many a stitch, parted, and by mediation, with much ado, made friends. <coughs> Dannington also witnessed the widespread practice of the vendetta, for which the injured party will wait an opportunity seven years but he will take you at the advantage, or else do it by some others whom he will hire for the purpose. In this sort were two slain in Pisa while I was there, the one a rich merchant, the other a knight of the order of Santo Stefano, the one coming from his hall, the other going thither, two also in Siena in seven days. 
and at my coming hither to Venice, for this is general through all Italy, there were on Shrove Sunday, at night, seventeen slain, and very many wounded. Besides that they there reported, there was almost every night one slain all that carnival time. As, as Colin Rose has been showing, Bologna was a particular focus for faction and feuding, and we need to bear this in mind when we consider the, the writings on insults by the Bolognese Camillo Baldi. Why was the situation in Bologna so bad? It's been suggested by Rose and by Stuart Cowell that this had much to do with the conquest of the city by Pope Julius II in 1506. Rule by priests was widely resented and the local aristocracy considered themselves to be defenders of civic liberty. The emasculation of the nobility was emblematic of a tyrannia ecclesiastica. Despite the outlawing of the practice in 1567, every noble family continued to employ teams of bravi for protection, heavies. During the 17th century, there was a vicious cycle of vendettas, which led to a hundred noble victims being killed or wounded. Violence spread from the city into the countryside, and it involved all social classes. And the estimated homicide rate for the region rose from 15 per 100,000 in 1620 to 61 in 1660. Dueling was an important part of this culture. However, the evidence concerning this is thin. The absence of evidence for actual duels has led some scholars to doubt their existence altogether. However, according to Carroll, the failure to locate the practice is a failure of interpretation. Italians, like their French counterparts, rarely use the term duel. Since dueling was illegal, it was dangerous to mention it, and duels were fought secretly. In the judicial archives, it is very difficult to distinguish the duel from the brawl, which is called Arisa. And the task is made more difficult by the invention of new practices which permitted the defence of honour <coughs> without falling foul of the law. And Italians refer to these encounters as questione or chistione. The concept of a legitimate questione was reinforced by the papal bull of 1582, Fermum Ita, which distinguished between a duel and the risa de improvisio. The condemnation of dueling and vengeance in the 25th session of the Council of Trent in 1563 and the outlawing of honour duels by Pope Clement VII in 1592 encouraged the development of what is called the scienza cavalleresca, the laws of honour which governed gentlemanly conduct. And these are first produced in the early to mid 16th century, and they provide a lively debate on the, sorry, a lively debate on their nature continues in print and in public disputations until the 18th century. Recently, Italian scholars have taken a positive view of the scienza cavalleresca, emphasizing its practical applications its disciplinary role in controlling the nobility and the social function of its rituals in peacemaking. The professors of the Scienza argue that it gave individuals the tools to settle their disputes peacefully and without recourse to the law, the so-called pace privata, the private peace, and that the resort to arms is no barrier to an eventual reconciliation. And crucial to this was the difference between the illegal duel arranged with malice of forethought and the spontaneous questione. So spontaneity is the key. If it comes about by surprise, it's okay. If you've planned it, it's illegal. Just to give you some idea of the richness of this debate, I'm going to show you quite quickly um, some of the key texts of this scienza cavalleresca. And I've highlighted here 21, 
of the key texts, and they're published between 1476 and 1619. So starting with um, 1476 with Perida del Pozzo, some in Latin, some later in the vernacular. We go through, does this work? So the mid-century. All of these, and these books are often very long, hundreds and hundreds of pages. So it's a very lively debate. It's clearly an important topic. And what's interesting is that by the time you get to the late um, 16th century, they stop using the word dual. So they will refer to it, for example, where are we? Here we go. Um, instead of what they would have used, the dual before, they call it private in, in the Nikitia. Because dueling is illegal, they stop referring to it. They use other terms. And then we get to, there we are, the early 17th century, and then the two texts, which I'm going to be talking about in a minute. Now, these books, which I've just shown you, they focus largely on the practical aspects of dueling, or questione. So, for example, how do you arrange a duel? What do you do with your seconds? What weapons do you use? Where do you meet? Where do you fight? Um, and also the peacemaking process. So that's largely their focus. All of the texts I've shown you, they devote a few pages, only a few pages, to the issue of mentite. And these translate as falsehoods, which are made knowingly, and to injure the reputations of others. So these are the insults. So all of these books talk about them, but only briefly. It's only with the works of Camillo Baldi in the early 17th century that entire books were devoted to the subjects of falsehoods and insults. So, who was Baldi? He's born in Bologna in 1550, and he dies there in 1637. From 1576 until his death, 61 years later, he taught at the University of Bologna. He held chairs in philosophy, logic, and umanarum literarum. He also served as pro-chancellor of the university and vicar of the Archduke. His writings include studies of Aristotle's ethics and his politics, Graphology, the relationship between the body and the soul, and alchemy. Towards the end of his life, Baldi wrote two works on falsehoods and verbal insults. And here's the first one. So in 1623, we have the first of his books, Delle Mentite et Offese di Parole. So that's 1623. And then the second text, this one. Dele considerazione e dubitazione sopra la materia delle mentite e affese di parole. Both of these books are long. The 1623 study has 350 pages, and the 1634 book has 557. These are extremely long books. They are both dedicated to members of the Bolognese elite. The 1623 text is mentioned occasionally by scholars in discussions of the Scienza Cavalleresca, but the 1634 text has been ignored almost entirely. So why might there be this neglect of this important text? I suspect that many people think it's just a second edition of the 1623 work, which it's not. It's clearly a different book. The content is the same topic, but it's a very different book. What the second book, the 1634 text does, is that it offers in over 100 chapters detailed arguments regarding honor, falsehoods, and peacemaking, as we will see. And in these chapters, each chapter is about six or seven pages long. And what Baldi does is he tells stories to make his points. So he will have these little short stories in the valley, sort of in the tradition of Boccaccio, to try and make a point. 
And these stories are set not just in the towns of Italy, but also in the countryside. And the only person I've ever found who's actually a modern scholar who's referred to the 1634 book, he describes it as a vast landscape which Balbi provides. It's an enormously rich source, not just for the study of insults, but also for the social and cultural history of Italy. And he's not just talking about what's happening in Bologna. He's got stories, and as we will see, he says that these are true stories. He's just removed the names to protect the innocent. Um, and they are from across Italy. So they are a very valuable resource if you're interested in the social and cultural history of Italy. And thanks to Google Books, you can download it. It's all scanned for nothing. So I hope people will work on it. Uh, in order to reveal Baldi's approach to insults and falsehoods, and also the richness of this longest of early modern commentaries on insults, what I'd like to do in the remainder of this paper is to share with you the dubi or arguments of this 1643, 1634 text. As we consider these, I'm going to show you basically the, the content of the book. As we consider these chapters, these arguments, I'd like you to keep some questions in mind. Here are the questions. Is this working? Sometimes. There we go. What subjects does Baldi highlight? What is important in this discussion? Are there any patterns in the topics which he discusses? Are some topics repeated? And if so, why? And how do these works fit into the tradition of the Shevchenza Cavalleresca that we've been discussing? And finally, how might we apply recent methodologies in the study of insults, for example, gender, class, linguistic analysis, to Baldi's works? So, let's make our way through. So this is the first book, there are two books, this is the first book, and we'll go through the chapters that he looks at. So, whether one who does not give vent to his rancour is dishonoured, and whether he must always do this, whether the defamed can defame others, whether the gentleman can retract what he has said, whether facts always remove spoken insults, whether the falsehood joined with rudeness is appropriate for a knight. A falsehood together with a blow is not audible whether one has to respond to a fraudulent falsehood, whether the gentleman has to respond to accusations made behind his back, why we wish to know whether others speak badly of us, and why we hate the speaker. <laughs> We've all been there. Why is it seen to be shameful to suffer damaging words, and whether it is worse to do or to suffer injury? that man is obliged to defend God's things, the fatherland and his prince, whether the gentleman should pursue the vendetta, whether it is wrong and blameworthy to pursue a vendetta whilst negotiating a peace, whether it is the act of a knight to deny the offence and to hide bad feelings towards the offender, whether contempt alone or the opinion of contempt makes a civil man warm or chivile angry whether there is a difference between the gentleman, the good citizen, and the good Christian, whether the gentleman must take account of what people say, whether it is enough for the gentleman to satisfy his conscience, whether it is honourable to avenge oneself against an enemy in every way that one can, whether a blow with a club is blameworthy, whether it is allowed for a gentleman to sell peace and for another to buy it, whether it is better to be or to seem good. Whether a poor artisan must hold a gentleman to account if he catches him with his wife. Whether a noble can reject making peace with an inferior. Why men are hard at making peace and have little obligation to those who make peace. Whether the falsehood given in the presence of the prince or in the house of others also offends them. There is no action more fitting for a gentleman than to negotiate and conclude peace. 
how to negotiate and conclude pieces, and what the mediators need to know. Should mediators start their negotiations with the offender or with the offended? Whether the offender should always ask for peace and when he should do it? Is it praiseworthy to ask for satisfaction and when and how to do this? Whether the offended should try to reveal the faults of the offender in the acts of peace? Whether asking peace and friendship is satisfaction? Whether the injured party can regain the honour thought to have been lost through the injury? Whether the honoured knight can, without shame, refuse to fight his equal? Whether the gentleman must always avenge hidden injuries, whether words or deeds? Whether the person injured secretly can avenge himself honourably? Whether the offended, having negotiated in a friendly way with the offender, can avenge himself? Finally, it's an ugly thing to offend others having given one's word. So that's the end of the first book. Book two. And here he starts off by saying, he states the aims of the second book. He's going to give advice about insults based on true cases and the names having been hidden. So, one can live without honour in the city. Being despised, vilified and hated is a very great evil to civil men. That in different people there is a diverse virtue and goodness, but not everyone is honoured equally. The reasons why men are honoured and how many and which are the grades of honour, and he gives categories of persons, so down from sort of princes to noblemen to the religious to merchants, artisans, going all the way down through different categories. Whether women, children and servants have honour, and whether they can give it or receive it. On insults and how others can lose your honour. What it means to lack honour and in how many ways that happens. Whether one who has lost their honour is dishonoured, and whether it is possible to put on it as before. Whether one who is offended accidentally must pursue vendetta and rancour against the offender. Whether for the offence with fraud, and with fraud it means this is an accusation which is a false accusation. It's clearly, it's one of these ritual accusations which later scholars have written about. So it's not to do with sort of an economic fraud, it's to do with falsity. Whether for the offence with fraud it is sufficient to say I was wrong to save one's arm. Whether the gentleman is entitled to quarrel with his wife's lover, which offence this might be, and what his grudge should be. Identifying adultery. Whether hidden offences and those done in secret merit a grudge, and what might be the way to avenge them whether one can make peace before everyone in every place and time without prejudice to those who make it. Whether one should have a grudge against someone who passes us in the street without greeting us. <coughs> whether it's laudable to call others to a questione without motive and for fun. <laughs> whether a gentleman can sell peace without blame. Whether in a public fight and questione, he who knows his satisfaction for himself must seek more. Whether it's good to put one's honour in the hands of others and through them make peace, and whether one must observe such a peace. Whether it is best to seek the satisfaction owed to one or to receive it from the offender voluntarily. What grudge can the civil man honourably have against the religious who injures him? Whether it is permitted to offend one's enemy whilst negotiating peace with him. Whether a knight despised by his prince, should hold a grudge for this affront. Whether a prince can make a reviled man honoured. Whether a poor and ignoble man can be refused negotiation by a noble. A notary from an honest family is clubbed. He feels that he cannot make an honourable peace unless he avenges himself. Whether the husband who is an honoured knight can be justly angry with his wife's lover. Whether testifying against someone in a criminal case is a vile act. How important is the loss of one's word, and how can one address this loss? How a craftsman, in this case an architect, can hold a grudge when he feels offended by some religious, and this he gives a little story, I think this is set in Bologna, about an architect who's been employed by some religious order to build a church somewhere, and they take exception and insult him, what should he do with them? Whether he who offends someone in our company or in our house, or who seeks our help, offends us. 
whether force and violence are ways to find the truth and the motive, whether the desire to offend oneself, avenge oneself is laudable. What is our obligation to those who come to us for help and are with us when others offend them and our words do not stop them? Whether we should favour or not someone in our company who assaults another? Whether after long and valiant service a soldier can be rejected for deeds done before he was a soldier? Whether or not a knight should be charged with a grave failing for behaving differently in private and in public? How may one be able to negotiate peace when the interested parties have not agreed for a long time? Whether the peace made by someone on their deathbed should be observed? Whether honour is born in us or rather it is necessary to acquire it? Whether every offence is capable of satisfaction and peace and how? Whether it is permitted to draw one's arms against he who provokes a question? Whether one has struck another in an whether one who has struck another in any way he wishes can say what he wants to the offender. How to treat and address fights and conflicts between close relatives. Whether a man from a good family who is otherwise regarded well does a vile deed in marrying a prostitute. Whether an honored knight must forgive the offense and always pardon someone who asks forgiveness and confesses his error and sin. That a leading lord does not have to seek satisfaction from someone who has long been his inferior. Outline of some opinions which may be used in making private pieces. Whether words can satisfy offences of deeds and what may be the value of the word in making pieces. Consideration on the motives which, according to Paris de Putio, induce men to make battalia, which is another word for the duel. Consideration of some words and deeds to be used in making pieces on the words which are often joined with deeds according to the writers on the jewel and their meanings. Whose turn it is to ask peace and to give conditions. Whether we are obliged to hold a grudge against those who offend our men, administrators, servants and those who live with us. Whether in the most serious offences the offended must kiss the offenders. On bad reports, witness statements and how one must deal with these find their conclusion. So I think you can say this is an exhaustive, <laughs> an exhausting discussion of the topics. It is extremely thorough. Um, but what I hope people will take from this, as I said at the beginning, a lot of the research on insults has been taken from these judicial cases or police reports. Um, and what I think we can get from texts such as Baldi's is a stepping back. Clearly there is a particular situation in Bologna which he feels it's necessary for him to comment on. And these, I think we have to recognize the Bolognese situation. But he is theorizing about situations which arise. How should these be dealt with? What can we do? And as I said before, we, we, we looked at this particular text. I was hoping as we go through, patterns would start to emerge. Can we see certain topics which are clearly important to him? Is there anything which recurs particularly? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Natalie? The gentleman with his family and talking to him is another one. He keeps going on about that. He talks often about the gentleman. The gentleman, what they should do. Yeah. The gentleman, what should they do? That, yes, we get lots of references to gentlemen. But do we, again, thinking about methodologies class, do we get references to people of other social states? For example. Inferior. Inferior. I've said inferiors. Good. So that's going on. But even gentlemen can be inferior sometimes. Mm -hmm. yes. Because he often we've got a couple of instances where he talks about the situation with the prince. What happens if your prince insults you? Do you have to take that as a, as a grudge, as an insult against you? How does that work? So again, this issue of hierarchy, I think we can apply this methodology to this text. Also, if we could think about gender, could that be a way of approaching texts such as this? Have we seen instances of gender coming up? Well, the discussion about the lovers. Yes. We've got various uh, the wife's love chapters together. on lovers. Um, I think one of the most horrifying 
because I said these, he tells little stories. One of the most horrifying stories he tells is of a husband and wife who are travelling in the countryside of the Friuli. So this is the area northeast of Venice. And they are set upon by a gang. And the husband is knocked unconscious. The woman is kidnapped. She's held for so many days. She's raped. She's then released. She's returned to her husband. And then the question is, the man who has kidnapped and raped the wife asks for forgiveness from the husband. What should the husband do? So we get quite sort of horrifying cases which, which he raises up in, up in um, but I, I think that we can take from, hopefully it shows as I say with, with the court cases um, clearly they're very rich they're very important but I think what we've got from texts such as, as Balladers is that um, just the sheer comprehensiveness of the issues which he raises the different situations which he discusses I think that I just argue that we should also look at texts such as these when we're thinking about the nature of insults in the early modern period. And hopefully people will work on this. So anyway, I think I will my time is up, I think. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So we've got about ten minutes or so for questions. Should anyone want to ask questions, elaborate, comment? So I have a question about how he works through these cases. Um, yeah. So does he take uh, some general principles about honor or something like that? And then, oh, thanks. So does he take uh, general principles about honor or status or something like that and then use that to try to answer the particular question? Or does he try to develop answers directly out of the cases? So is he doing a kind of casuistical type reasoning or is he trying to argue from some kind of larger principle? I think that's a very good question. Hopefully you can see from the way, this is why I took it, I'm sorry for listing all of this, thing. but it's important to do it this way I think because you can see how it's organized or rather apparently not organized. Mm -hmm. Because okay, he's this professor at the University of Bologna, but this is not organized in a systematic way. I hope you can, you can see that. Often these topics come up again and again, but in different places. So he is looking at these particular case studies to try and work out what would you do in this situation. Obviously he's got a view, a particular view of certain things, but he's looking at sort of a case by case basis. What do we need to do in this situation? And it's very much sort of case driven. So, so thank you. Hi. Susanna. I was very interested in the aspects of this history that relate to reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering whether there has been any work done on the ways in which this history might inform a kind of genealogy of contemporary TRC reconciliation reparation, which tends to be thought of as a kind of uniquely contemporary for me. Right, so this is like the history of this. No, thank you, that's a very good question. Um, the Scienza Cavalleresca, of which this is a part, has been the focus of recent research. And particularly by young Italian scholars. And what they have tended to focus on is the peacemaking aspects. So I'm thinking of books by people like Paolo Brogio, um, who's written monographs and also edited collections on peacemaking in the early modern period. So this is something which is of interest to historians. So hopefully, um, modern contemporary resonances can be found um, from texts such as this. I'm hoping that um, it, it triggers off, um, this is one example of how we can look at a contemporary issue and see the history of that issue. Um, I gave a previous version of this paper um, to another audience, and I found out later, I didn't know at the time, but I found out later, half the audience were like, experts on linguistic analysis. They weren't just students, they were experts on linguistic analysis. And what they are trying to do at the moment, there is an increasing focus on contemporary analysis of impoliteness of insults, what's happening now. But they're starting to think about, well, what, how, where does it come from? So we do, these texts can show us the history of various issues, whether it's peacemaking or impoliteness or insults or whatever. So hopefully we can use them for that as well. Thank you, John, for a, for a very interesting um, uh, presentation. 
Um, what can you tell us about the reader of, of mm. his book? You, you get a sense yeah. that it's very culturally specific. I yes. mean, this, would a Frenchman have, have taken this the same way, for example, as a, as a Northern Italian? What, what, what's your conclusions about the reader? That's a good question. Um, many of the books which I, I listed from the Scienza Cavalerice, if you go through many um, editions, and not just in Italian, but they're translated into other European languages. Guess how many editions of this text do we have? <laughs> one. There's only ever one edition. And the question is why? What I need, well, what I need to do is to see if we can find in other subsequent works references to this text. That's something out which I need to do next. But this text is not reprinted. Why? I, I think it may be because it's to do with a sp specific Bolognese situation, that as Colin Rose has been showing, this is exactly the period when violence in Bologna escalates. There's clearly a big problem in Bolognese society. How can we deal with it? Um, and also, what Baldi does when he looks at these issues which are raised, he's trying to calm people down. He's trying to say, if possible, you, know, you don't need to respond in these situations because this is just escalating the violence, so that he is trying to control that violence. So I think it's a particular Bolognese response. Um, and also in terms of the, the actual, if you think of the reader, the first reader, who are they dedicated to? Both the text, the 1623 text and the 1634 text, are dedicated to members of the Bolognese elite. So people from within that particular society. And as I said, these are the sorts of people who are walking around the streets with bodyguards in this period. So that's the immediate revision. So hopefully that answers. Thank you. That was a fascinating paper. I'm wondering, looking at the this um, catalogue of insults, um, about the overlap between um, maybe public versus private yeah. actions, yeah. intentions, yeah. Um, and deliberate versus accidental, yes. uh, uh, being insulted in secret and whether yes. that's sort of valid or not. Um, I suppose particularly at this level of society where, where you know, one one has a public position yeah. and I know that it's, it's problematic at this period whether or not there's a sense of, of a private self in the same way that we fondly suppose we have now. Um, but but if you, you think, think and this is, I mean, Bologna is, is if we think, going back to sort of approaches to insults and the research which has been done different places in different times, there are important correspondences, and this is when David was working on 18th century Paris, he highlights the importance of honour and loss of honour uh, and what that can do in terms of your status, for example, economic status. You know, if, 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 if you're a merchant or whatever, you lose your good name, that could have an economic cost. So often with men, when they're being insulted, it's to do with their honesty. So this, is, this goes to the heart of your status within that particular community. Without a good name, what can you do? But as you, as, you, as you rightly point out, he does come back again and again to this issue of secrecy. What about these things which are done in secret? What about if we hear from a friend that somebody is speaking badly and is behind our back? What do we do? Sort of plausible Yeah. Yeah. So there's the, the secrecy aspect. There's also, as you said, the spo spontaneous aspect, that um, things can arise spontaneously or falsely, because that's something else which comes up again and again, this idea of false accusations. And this would relate to, remember I talked about these studies of uh, the United States, Labov, and these impossible insults, which are clearly not true. And that was still an issue, that was an issue which they recognised in the period, that they know there are these impossible insults, do you need to respond to them? So again, that comes back to the point of the history of all these issues. This isn't anything new, I mean, what's happening in black communities in the United States in the 1970s, this has been happening before, and they were writing about it, which is interesting. I think the honour of the last question goes to Constant Muse. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm very interested in, you mentioned John of Legnano as a, a 14th century writer, but I suppose I'm interested in the, the legal background. He was also Bolognese. Mm. This, I suspect, is coming 
from a legal culture. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in your reflections, whether it's something specifically 17th century, or whether this is really simply a continuation of a really established set of legal reflections. And if it's legal, then do we have to be careful about how we read it as a description of behavior? That's a very good point, Constance. Thank you for raising Many, and I, I gave you that list of the authors of the Scienza Cavalleresca. Many of them are knights, but many of them are lawyers. And this is a tradition, there is a legal tradition as part of this genre, which is important to recognize. Baldi is not a professor of law, but clearly he's associated with professors who don't belong. Um, so there is this legal tradition which they are familiar with. And remember, they, they, they are called, there is the Scienza Cavalleresca. And the authors are referred to as the professors of the scienza. It is a scienza. It is a branch of knowledge. So there is that aspect to it. So you're right to say that we need to think about the legal. Also, we think about well, what's happening legally. Because of this, what form of, of justice or um, retribution is this? They're not going to the courts. This is private peace. This is pace privata. They're keeping this away from the authorities for whatever reason. So how do they deal with that? And also, you've got this idea of also witness statements, and then the final one of that. Um, if you are going to go to court, you know, if somebody makes a false statement on the court, well, how do you deal with that? So it's a strange relationship that they've got, but it's largely private. Okay, I think we need to end with two thank yous. First of all, to Jonathan for sharing his current research with us, and we look forward to reading the book <laughs> from it. <Excellent. laughs>
this south end, uh, south wing, and it's called The World Through Music. So it features um, musical traditions of India and Indonesia, and it combines digitised LP sound recordings from our LP collection with supporting materials from Rare Books and our um, unique Southeast Asia pamphlets collection and musical instruments that have um, from the Monash, sorry, the music archive of Monash University, MAMU, uh, through Sir Zelman Cowan School of Music and their um, Indonesian and Indian instruments. So lots to see. They'll all be uh, around in June, so please come in and enjoy. And meantime, um, talk to the Rebels team about these beautiful pieces here that some of you may be interested in and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.